So I think I will start with the introduction. Um, hello, everybody. It's my distinct pleasure to um, introduce Dr. Nihal Alten Bonet um, to you today for our seminar. Um, Dr. Altan Bonet is the head of the Laboratory of Post Pathogen Dynamics at the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute of the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda. And the emphasis is really on dynamics here as she uses the dynamic tool of life cell microscopy um, to really look um, into the viral exploitation of the host. Um, and it goes uh, with this approach beyond individual molecules and rather induces sort of a complete picture of the cell physiology and architecture in response to the viral infection. Niall received her PhD in cellular biophysics from Sandy Simons lab at the Rockefeller University in New York, and then did her postdoctoral studies with uh, Jennifer Lippincott Schwartz at um, NIH. And after that, she took uh, on a junior faculty position at Rutgers University before returning to the NIH and building her own laboratory where she's now um, a senior investigator. Um, she's really not your usual virologist coming to the field with an allegiance to any specific virus. Um, we just talked about it. She actually has about 22 viruses actively replicating in her lab currently. But so she's rather interested in, in, in looking at um, viruses in general and the general principles and the common strategies that viruses employ to um, exploit the host cell. And that has led to important discoveries. Um, one of them is um, the discovery that many viruses alter the host lipid metabolism to assemble viral replication platforms in the cells. Um, she's specifically focused on the host encoded lipid kinase, phosphatidyl inositol 4, 4 kinase, or PI4P, which is hijacked by multiple different RNA viruses uh, to generate these enriched, lipid enriched replication compartments where the PI4P. P is also a cofactor for viral replication. And the second um, 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 notable um, um, discovery is really the identification of a novel form of viral infectious units, viruses traveling en masse in, inside of vesicles. And this is, she has shown that this is a form of transfect, transmission that is much more infectious and virulent, virulent than viruses as single free particles. So recently she has applied also her imaging skills to um, corona inf coronavirus infected cells, um, really has shown for the first time how these viruses exit from the cells and found that they piggyback on an unusual cellular pathway, the lysosomal exocytosis pathway, um, really showing that this is how um, coronaviruses, including SARS-CoV-2 exit from the cell and that this process is actually fundamentally altering lysosomal functions, including antigen presentation in the infected cells. Um, she has been recognized um, for her, work, her research with many, um, with many awards. She is an elected fellow to the American Academy of Microbiology, the Presidential Early Career Award winner in science and engineering. She, she held many fellowships, including a Caffley Fellowship and um, she received the Norman P. Salzman Memorial Award in Virology. So with, without further ado, ado, I want to hand over the stage to Nihal. She's going to share her newest discovery, how enteric viruses transmit, a uh, story recently accepted in Nature. Congratulations. And Nihal, we're so happy to have you here. The stage is yours. Thank you. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Melanie, uh, for the kind introduction. As Melanie uh, uh, just mentioned, in my lab at NIH, uh, we are very much interested in exploring viral transmission strategies. Um, and towards this goal, we work at the crossroads of a wide variety of disciplines, from virology and cell biology to immunology, public health, and even environmental engineering. Um, we have a diverse box of tools with which we carry out these investigations. These include in vivo and ex vivo models, uh, super resolution imaging techniques like CLEM, cryo EM, SIM storm microscopy, and single mo molecule uh, bio genome imaging through FISH, 
Um, and uh, we also uh, take advantage of lipidomics, proteomics uh, to characterize the viral compartments, single cell RNA seq to characterize the cells that these viruses um, infect, and, and a lot of computational modeling is sprinkled throughout these approaches. So um, our interest really in transmission strategies uh, started about 10 years ago. Uh, when we started to think about the conventional view of viral transmission, which is depicted in this movie, where um, it's a, a cell gets infected by a virus, typically one or two viruses are sufficient to infect the cell, the virus replicates in the cell, and then the cells often die either by lysis or apoptosis after being infected, the new viruses that were formed emerge and spread as freely moving independent particles to other hosts. And, uh, and as I just mentioned, few or even one virus particle is sufficient to infect and replicate in another host cell. And in fact, this movement of the virus particles independently from one another is thought to uh, confer an advantage onto viruses, that this way they can spread to ho hosts far and wide and, and, and generate infection. Um, and so we've, we've been really looking at these premises of this conventional view for the last past 10 years. And one of the things that, you know, really surprised us is that cell death, which is uh, thought to occur uh, often with viral infections, is really a very inflammatory process, releasing cellular markers into the extracellular environment, which then attracts um, uh, immune cells to the site of infection. And from a viral perspective, um, this is really counterindicative for most viruses for, for, for spreading. And so one of the experiments we often do in the lab whenever we start working with a new virus is to look in different cell types, how it, whether it releases from cells in a, in a lytic process or in a non-lytic process. And uh, I'm not going to talk about coronaviruses today, um, surprise, but, uh, but I wanted to just illustrate, for instance, uh, with coronaviruses, whether it's uh, SARS-CoV-2 or MERS or, or murine hepatitis virus, when you infect cells with these viruses, the viruses can, the newly made viruses can happily come out of the cells, this is what you see in this blue line here, all the while, the, the cellular membrane, the plasma membrane is intact. So there's uh, very little lysis, uh, if at all, taking place uh, uh, in these coronavirus infected cells. So they don't need the cell to lyse in order to um, get out of the cells. And in fact, we showed, uh, as Melanie mentioned, uh, uh, at the end of 2020, that uh, coronaviruses like SARS uh, use uh, an interesting, uh, uh, less well-studied uh, exocytic pathway in the cell called lysosomal exocytosis to get out. So after being synthesized in the, on the ER and the double membrane vesicles, they traffic to lysosomes and package inside lysosomes and, and, and be transported out via this lysosomal exocytic process. Another virus we've been studying quite heavily for the past 10 years is a non-enveloped virus, uh, poliovirus. So it's just a capsid, it doesn't have a membrane around it. And this virus um, remarkably uh, also leaves the cells without lysis. So if you think about the topology, how is this virus coming out of the cells without lysing, given that it doesn't have an envelope on it, how is it able to cross the plasma membrane? Uh, but it does. And, and this is just uh, in, a, in a tissue culture experiment, again, where you see uh, poliovirus uh, uh, releasing from the cell over the course of infection. And uh, in the orange bars, there's no change in the plasma membrane permeability of these cells. So this virus, a non-enveloped virus, is able to get out of cells uh, without lysing the, uh, the cells. So how does it do it? So uh, about seven years ago, uh, we uh, 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 started on this journey to figure this out. And, and uh, we discovered that poliovirus and other non-enveloped uh, viruses, such as Coxsackie virus and rhinovirus, which is one of the agents of the common cold, they're released from cells in vesicles and at these extracellular vesicles. And so the scanning EM picture that I have here is of a pole, edge of a poliovirus infected cell. And you see these three vesicles that have emerged from the cell. And these vesicles, if you collect them and do transmission EM on them and slice them open, 
cut them across in half, you see that they have a single bilayer membrane and inside is chock full of uh, poliovirus particles. And so you see these uh, electron dense structures, these are poliovirus particles. So what excited us uh, was really this, this phenomena of this extracellular vesicles uh, being used to release these non-enveloped viruses in a non-lytic fashion from the cells. And more, perhaps more importantly, more significantly, the, the presence of multiple poliovirus particles um, transiting together, transmitting together from the cell, as opposed to individual uh, freely moving poliovirus particles. Now, in the case of poliovirus, Coxsackie virus, and rhinovirus, um, we and others have shown that these viruses are actually the way they get out via these extracellular vesicles is that once they're synthesized in the cell, they get captured in autophagosomes. Um, and you can see this in both the transmission EM images inside a cell showing autophagosomes with multiple poliovirus particles in them, also by immunofluorescence with autophagosomal markers and antibodies that recognize newly assembled uh, poliovirus particles. And more recently, uh, we've been doing uh, cryo-EM work with Lars Anders Carlsen in, in Sweden. And uh, we can see that these autophagosomes, are, uh, it's this packaging into autophagosomes is very selective and only captures the RNA-filled infectious capsids of poliovirus. So empty capsids, which would look translucent in this cryo-EM, um, very rarely get uh, packaged inside these uh, autophagosomes for transmission. So uh, this is a really um, interesting uh, uh, behavior and, and, and something really we're looking into uh, pursuing further. Once these autophagosomes are formed with the viral cargo in them, with the infectious viral cargo in them, they transit to the plasma membrane and the outer membrane of the autophagosome fuses with the plasma membrane. And that's how you end up with the inner membrane, uh, that vesicle that you saw in that um, scanning EM picture I showed you, which is what is released outside, which contains the poliovirus uh, clusters. Um, since that work, we've been, uh, 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 that which the, that early work that I just showed you was really done um, uh, in vitro, in in vitro cell lines, infected cell lines. We've uh, put in a considerable amount of effort into looking at uh, whether viruses uh, are present in clusters um, being transported en masse like this in, in vivo, um, whether in animals, uh, uh, infection models, or among uh, humans who might be infected with these uh, viruses. So we've developed methodologies to search for these uh, virus-filled uh, extracellular vesicles in various secretions like feces um, to label them and to investigate their fate in, uh, in animals. And, uh, and, and part of this work led to discovery in 2018 that two enteric viruses, norovirus and rotavirus, um, which uh, uh, are known to infect um, the, the gut, the cells of the gut, are actually shed uh, and released into the feces inside these extracellular vesicles in clusters. And um, in fact, uh, uh, in patients infected with norovirus, uh, more than 50% uh, of the virus in the, in, the, in the feces can be inside these vesicles um, uh, transmitted this way. Um, since our work and others, uh, some many other viruses are now being discovered to have uh, either solely transmit through these extracellular vesicles and clusters or have secondary forms that are uh, of, uh, of a vesicle enclosed form where they're transmitting multiple uh, either viral particles or viral genomes um, or a mixture of both. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, hepatitis C virus, which is a classical enveloped virus that uses the secretory pathway to get out also appears to have in vivo a secondary form of the virus where you have extracellular vesicles transporting um, multiple naked hepatitis C genomes uh, 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 together. Uh, one of the first experiments we did when we discovered this new type of infectious unit was to compare its infectivity to that of free viruses. 
And, uh, and this is an illustration of some of this early work where uh, we took poliovirus containing uh, vesicles and inoculated them into a dish of cells, uh, dish A in this case. And in parallel, we took exactly the same number of poliovirus particles uh, as we had in this inoculum, uh, but in the free form. So they were not uh, binned in these vesicles and instead inoculated that into a second dish, uh, say dish B. And uh, post inoculation, but importantly, pre replication, we could fix these cells and carry out single molecule RNA fish to see what, what was the distribution of the infection like uh, before any replication uh, started. And uh, what we observed in the dish B that got the free virus inoculum, um, most of the cells had a viral genome in them. So this is the input viral RNA genome, but the numbers of these viral RNA genomes were low, often one or two genomes you would find such as here with this single red dot. Whereas in dish A that got the, the vesicle inoculum, most of the cells were empty, for devoid of viral uh, input, but you would find occasionally uh, a cell with a cluster of viral genomes that had entered in them. And that makes sense because the vesicle is, is transmitting um, en masse uh, a, a group of uh, uh, viral genomes. But what was really surprising was when we followed this, these dishes, so rather than fixing them uh, prior to replication, let them replicate one cycle and then measure the amount of virus produced, um, we would have expected that dish B, at least according to the conventional paradigm, where every cell pretty much got a viral input, to have replicated more virus than dish A. But instead, uh, the, the results uh, were the opposite. And um, so this case, this experiment was done with macrophages, but we could do this with other cell types. And uh, always the dish that got the vesicle inoculum produced more virus, replicated more virus than the dish that got the free virus uh, uh, inoculum. And this was not just an in vitro uh, result. In vivo as well, uh, we observed the same thing. So if we took mice and uh, fed them with vesicles containing rotavirus and took in parallel mice and fed them with free rotavirus and the amount of input genome in both cases was identical, the mice that were fed the vesicles within two days uh, would have massively um, infected enterocytes where re rotavirus replicates, whereas the mice that were fed with the free uh, version of the virus had much fewer enterocytes infected. So what this suggests to, suggested to us is that there are barriers to replication <clears throat> when one or two few viral particles enter cells. And these barriers may be due to slow kinetics of translation, replication, not being able to compensate potentially for each other's uh, variabilities. These are after all RNA viruses and they carry mutations. Some or all of this uh, may be making viruses more vulnerable to elimination by host innate defenses when they go in low numbers into the cells. Whereas when viruses go in on block or on mass, either via extracellular vesicles or viral aggregates, um, they can potentially increase the initial rates at which viral proteins are made, um, viral RNA is synthesized and, and overcome these host defenses. Indeed, when we increase the concentration of free viruses in our inoculums, uh, as in the case here with rotavirus that we're feeding the animals, um, we can mimic the infectivity of the vesicle cloaked viruses, which only carry a fifth in this case of the, of the viral load. We really are in the process right now of examining this replication barrier further. And I wanna just show, share with you some of our results from this that are un unpublished. And we're really exploring this now using just free uh, uh, virus containing inoculums. So in the next couple of slides, they're really not gonna be any, any, any vesicles, but really free viruses that we're manipulating the concentration um, to mimic uh, a, a vesicle mediated on block infection. And so one of the experiments we have done is um, we've taken, for instance, primary human macrophages and, in, uh, and taken three um, sets, three dishes of these primary human macrophages and infected each dish uh, with a concentration of free poliovirus. So just free um, poliovirus inoculums. 
Um, in this case, dish A got the, the most dilute free poliovirus inoculum, dish B got an intermediate, and dish C got the most concentrated free poliovirus inoculum. And what we did in this case is after doing the inoculation, uh, we didn't wait very long. Uh, we didn't want the viruses to start replicating. We fixed the cells. And uh, as soon as we fixed them, we did um, single molecule RNA fish and then uh, det uh, to detect the input viral genomes that had gone into the cells and to count those input viral genomes in, uh, in each cell. And that data is what's plotted here. And in a way, nothing surprising here, the, the dish that got the most dilute free poliovirus inoculum, the majority of the cells here, more than 90%, had only zero to two, <coughs> excuse me, um, input viral genomes in them at the start. Uh, whereas the dish C that got the most concentrated um, uh, uh, poliovirus inoculum had uh, 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 more cells uh, with at least, for instance, more than 20 genomes in them at, as an input uh, viral RNA. So this wasn't very surprising. But what was surprising is when we repeated this experiment in duplicate, and now the second uh, set of dishes A, B, and C were not fixed right after adding the inoculum, uh, but instead allowed to proceed with a round of replication. And then at the end of that round of replication, we um, quantified the number of cells that had replicated the poliovirus. Um, versus not replicated the poliovirus. And what was surprising was that uh, the, 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 not, the cells, the proportion of cells that were replicating the poliovirus in each um, inoculum concentration, initial input inoculum concentration, um, correlated with the population of cells in each inoculum concentration that started with more than 20 uh, viral genomes in them. So, what this tells us is that replication is an extremely inefficient process and ramping up the number of viruses inside the cells seem to pass a critical mass that allows replication. Um, what it also says is that the virus does not need to infect 100% of the cells to be successful at replication, but it does need to be 100% efficient at replicating once it enters one cell. So can we learn something more from this stochasticity? So can we predict viral replication by pre-replication cytoplasmic viral mass? In other words, can we match the distribution of how much virus has entered a cell at a pre-replication time point with the probability of the virus replicating in that cell at a later time point? And we can do this uh, computationally by setting a cutoff um, X, which is the input virus quantity into the cell, and estimating the frequency of successful replication uh, if the number of input viruses below X or above X. And we can uh, sweep this cutoff um, from one viral input to 100 viral inputs. So we could go even higher. And then the idea being is to match this uh, with this uh, level of replication we see um, at a later time point. And we can do this for different cell types. We can do this with HeLa cells, we can do this macrophages, MCF7, you name it. And we've done this now with three cell types in culture. And very interestingly, uh, we find that for these three cell types, a HeLa cell or a macrophage cell or an MCF7 cell, there is a cutoff of input mass that poliovirus has to go in with in order to replicate. And that cutoff is about 14. So you need 14 poliovirus particles in order to go into a HeLa or a macrophage or an MCF7 minimum in order to pass this hump and be able to replicate. Interestingly, the vesicles that I showed you earlier on that are conduits for unmasked uh, a viral transmission uh, typically have, you know, 20, 25 particles per vesicle. So in the case of poliovirus, uh, there's about 20 poliovirus particles 
packaged per vesicle, similarly for the rotavirus as well. So these vesicles may be a way in which the viruses can uh, reach this critical input mass uh, and, and replicate. So in the rest of the talk, um, I'm going to present you some, uh, uh, so we're going to switch gears just a little bit. Um, uh, we're still going to be talking about enteric viruses, uh, but this is um, a new work that, uh, that, as Melanie mentioned, was recently accepted for publication. Um, that's also uh, go, is focused on transmission, but really more about transmission between organisms. So a little larger scale transmission rather than cell to cell between organisms and um, uh, potentially a new uh, route of transmission for enteric viruses. That may explain um, some of their global prevalence. So enteric viruses uh, include the major ones are norovirus, rotavirus, and astrovirus. And these infections are widespread um, and combined infect one and a half billion people per year globally. Uh, and uh, interestingly, they're prevalent. The infection prevalence is, is pretty much evenly distributed across developing and developed countries. Um, they're the major cause of mortality and morbidity associated with enteric disease across the globe. They incur significant eco economic costs. And uh, as I showed you earlier, these viruses replicate in the intestine. They shed into feces in vesicle contained populations. Um, and they are uh, uh, accepted as transmitting via the fecal oral route to hosts. So they get shed in the feces and that fecal contamination of hands, food or water then allows these viruses to go in via the oral route to another host and, 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 and begin the cycle anew. So uh, uh, for the last few years, we've been looking using animal models to look at the transmission of, uh, of rotaviruses and noroviruses, astroviruses to get a little bit more, uh, uh, shed a little bit more light about the transmission routes and the, and the uh, efficiency of transmission via the fecal oral route of these viruses. And uh, in order to do these works, uh, we can use adult animals and, uh, uh, to do the uh, oral gavages and infections, but we can also use these suckling pups, um, which are excellent uh, models for enteric virus infection because these pups are, are, have very immature immune and digestive systems, which makes them prone to uh, infection easily uh, with, um, uh, for instance, the murine version of norovirus, MNME1, or a murine version of rotavirus, EDIF. And typically what we do is we orally gavage the pups with these viruses, which we have obtained from um, a previously infected animal's feces. Um, and then we put the pups back onto their mothers to continue to suckle. And uh, as uh, has been published by many others, uh, the, when you look at the pup's intestines after doing this oral gavage, within three days, you get a um, very uh, robust infection of their uh, intestinal tissues, either with the norovirus or with, with the rotavirus. And then if you continue longer um, uh, to monitor these animals, these pups, you see that the infection starts to clear off. And by 10 or 14 days, it's really completely cleared in the intestine of these pups, whether they had norovirus to begin with, or rotavirus or, or astrovirus. So there is a clearance of the infection. Um, this clearance of the infection correlates with the rapid rise of pup intestinal secretory IgA levels. So if we look at these pups intestines and measure the uh, intestinal IgA in the lumen, you see that there's a steady rise of intestinal IgA, which correlates with the, the clearance of, uh, of the infection from the intestines, pups, uh, pups intestines, excuse me. Now, because these are pups that are still suckling, they're about 10 day old pups, they don't yet make uh, much of their own immune response. And they get their secretory IgA almost wholly from their mother's milk. Uh, 
And if we go and now collect their mother's milk in this experiment and measure the secretory IgA in their mother's milk, we see a very nice uh, symmetry uh, in the rise in the mother's milk of also this secretory IgA, so which correlates beautifully with the rise in secretory IgA in the pups intestines. But what was really surprising to us is when we collected the mother's mammary glands, um, we found a very robust replication of uh, murine noroviruses and, and rotaviruses in an animal where the, her pups had been orally infected with rotavirus. So the mammary glands were replicating um, these enteric viruses. Now, up to this point, these are enteric viruses. They, all we know about them from the literature and what's been published is that they replicate in the intestine, intestinal tissues. Um, but now we were seeing these viruses replicating in the mammary glands. And in the mammary glands, they were specifically replicating in the epithelial cells, lining the ducts, the milk ducts, and also in the, in the immune cells, such as the B cells and the plasma cells uh, that produce the IgA, they were replicating these viruses. So we started to wonder, how do the enteric viruses from the pups reach the mother's mammary glands? And how does the mother sense her pup's infection and increase her milk secretory IgA production so as to clear that infection? And a conventional dogma, the answer to both these questions is that there's fecal oral transmission of enteric viruses from the pups to the mothers. These pups um, that are being orally gavaged with these viruses, they're still suckling from their mothers, so they're sharing the same cage as their mothers. And when they get sick and they produce uh, feces that's infected with these viruses, um, their mother most likely is going to um, uh, be in contact with that feces orally herself by licking her pups and whatnot and become orally infected. Her gut become infected with these viruses. And what has been um, uh, assumed is that that um, infection in her gut um, will lead to the trafficking of her immune cells from the gut to the mammary gland. Um, this is so-called the mammary gut axis. And in the mammary gland, then uh, produce IgA, secretory IgA, and, uh, and, and, and release that into the milk. So we wanted to know, is this first the virus that we're seeing in the mammary gland coming from um, the mother being orally um, uh, contaminated and, and being infected, her gut being infected with the virus, and her milk SIGA, is that also due to that, her gut uh, being infected and her immune cells from the gut trafficking to the mammary gland. So in order to test this, we did an experiment where we directly inoculated the mothers. So we didn't inoculate the pups, but we directly inoculated the mothers orally with these viruses, in this case, the rotavirus. And then over a um, uh, uh, number of days, we measured the amount of secretory IgA in her milk, whether we would see a bump as we saw uh, previously when our pups were all inoculated. And, and we didn't, and we didn't see this bump. Eventually there is, but not in the time scale that we're seeing the bump uh, in the pups. Moreover, when we looked at the mammary glands of these mothers to see if there was any virus they're replicating, we didn't find any virus in the mammary glands of the mothers, even though within two days, her intestine was robustly replicating the, the, the virus. So we knew her intestine could get infected, but we didn't see any transfer of that virus to her mammary gland. So at this point, we were kind of puzzled where to go. Um, some of the data didn't make sense to us. It didn't fit with the conventional model of the gut mammary axis. And we, looking through the literature, we came across many, many um, instances, reports of, uh, of these enteric viruses being detected in the saliva of, of patients, of infected patients, children and adults and elderlies. And this um, presence of saliva um, was always chalked up to being a contaminant uh, 
um, the virus being contaminating the saliva because uh, humans uh, throw up when they're infected with these viruses. And so you would get the viruses in their, on their oral cavity and in their saliva because of contamination from, uh, from the intestinal infection. That's how it, at least it was um, uh, concluded. Uh, but we thought, you know, it's interesting that we're seeing this phenomena when we have the pups orally inoculated and the pups are suckling on their mothers. And we asked, could it be through saliva? Could the pup's saliva be having the virus and transmitting to the mother's mammary glands um, through the suckling process? Saliva in both animals and, and in humans is produced by the major salivary glands. Uh, there are essentially three of them, the parotid sublingual and the submandibular gland. In mice, the submandibular gland is the largest. In humans, the parotid uh, salivary gland is the largest. And within these salivary glands, you have these salivary units, uh, which are called asini. And uh, these are epithelial cells that um, generate much of the saliva. And then the saliva is transmitted through these ducts, which are surrounded themselves by um, ductal epithelial cells. When we um, looked at the saliva, uh, when we collected saliva from the orally gavaged animals and, uh, and see if they had any virus in them, we've detected uh, both rotavirus and norovirus in the saliva of these animals. And this virus that was detected was infectious. So you could take this virus and culture it in cells. It, it, would, uh, it would form infectivity. So we knew that these animals are able to release infectious virus in their saliva. And this virus that's in the saliva was infectious as well in other animals. So we could take the saliva um, from the pups and inoculate orally other pups or even adult animals, and then look in the intestine of those animals and find replication. So this saliva could transmit infection um, to other individuals, to other animals. And interestingly, the combination of saliva and milk in this pup, suckling pup mother model could transmit infection um, uh, really efficiently. So we did this experiment, but we had a mother whose pups were orally gavaged with rotavirus and put back on her to suckle for about 24, day, uh, 24 hours. And then 24 hours later, those pups that had been orally gavaged with the virus were removed and put on another mother uh, from another cage. And that mother's pups were put on the original mother whose pups had been orally gavaged. So we had two mothers, A and B, pups A and B, pups A had been orally infected with the virus. And then 24 hours later, pups A were put on mother B to suckle and mother and pups B were put on mother A to suckle. And two days later, we harvested the tissues, the mother's mammary glands, both mother's mammary glands and both, mother, both pups' intestines. And what we saw is robust infection uh, rep and replication of the virus in all these tissues, indicating transfer of, uh, of virus through saliva and transfer infection of the mammary gland and transfer back through milk of virus to uh, second sets of pups. Um, again, some of you may be thinking, well, you know, this saliva could also be contaminant from the gut, you know, the virus contaminating um, the, the saliva. Uh, so what we did here is we looked at the salivary glands um, in animals that had been uh, infected with norovirus, rotavirus, or astrovirus. In pups or adults, we could find robust uh, replication of these viruses within the salivary glands. So this told us that the salivary glands themselves could be infectable uh, with these viruses and could replicate these viruses and release infectious virus into the saliva. And within the salivary gland, it was in intriguing the noroviruses replicated primarily in the acinar epithelial cells and in as well as in the immune cells uh, within the salivary gland. We, we haven't yet gone into which types of immune cells are, are being infected. Uh, others suffice to say that they're all CD45 positive. And interestingly, rotaviruses replicated primarily in the ductal epithelial cells, which are below the asini, um, and as well as the uh, immune cells. 
so there is an interesting tropism of the two viruses, the different aspects of the, of the salivary uh, uh, tissue. Importantly, we look to see if persistent enteric viruses could also persistently replicate in salivary glands. There are persistent flavors of noroviruses that can infect the gut and be, um, be not cleared um, uh, for a variety of reasons and be uh, replicating and, and shedding into feces for weeks and months at a time. And so when we took these um, uh, species of noravirus, uh, uh, MNV4, for instance, or MNV3, and inoculated, um, orally inoculated animals with them, we could see that and then monitored a variety of tissues over uh, a number of weeks, uh, the salivary glands, the colon, the pyrus patches, the, the spleen, we would see that while the infections would clear from the pyrus patches and spleen, um, uh, the infection in the, in the salivary gland and in the colon would persist almost at similar levels. And um, uh, uh, related to this, if we collected the saliva from these animals uh, we, for weeks, we would see persistent shedding of these um, noroviruses uh, into, the, into the saliva, much like the persistent shedding into the, into the feces from the um, colon. We did an experiment uh, that was technically challenging uh, where we um, removed uh, 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 some of the salivary glands from the mice. We couldn't remove all of them. We removed uh, only the submandibular salivary gland and then inoculated these mice with um, uh, 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 norovirus and then asked what happens to the gut infection, infection in the gut. And what we observed is that when the salivary glands um, had been partially removed from these animals, the gut infection cleared faster. And so this is really uh, intriguing because it potentially um, uh, indicates that the, the, the saliva that's being produced with the viruses inside, when, when one swallows that saliva, um, it could uh, promote the persistence of these viruses in the gut. It could, it could in, in, increase the infection or reinfection of the gut by just um, swallowing the saliva with the viruses. Um, the data so far, hopefully, um, uh, 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 has, has convinced you, at least in animals, uh, that, that saliva uh, is, a, is a transmission route for these enteric viruses. Um, to the talk, thinking about going back to that map of how prevalent these infections are around the world, this prevalence, um, which doesn't seem to match with the level of sanitation practices around the globe that are based on the, you know, the fecal oral transmission route, may be due to salivary extra oral transmission. Because saliva uh, uh, can transmit these viruses to others via talking, um, singing, coughing, kissing, sharing ut utensils, all of these um, produce salivary droplets um, uh, in the air when we, uh, uh, when we partake in this. So new sanitation measures may be needed um, uh, in order to prevent this uh, form of transmission. And another uh, issue that's raised potentially from this work is that infectious enteric viruses could be shed through saliva asymptomatically in the absence of uh, diarrhea, potentially. Um, uh, so saliva may also be a new diagnostic tool. There are many questions uh, this work is, is, is raised that we're really beginning to uh, scratch the surface off. And one of these I wanted to uh, point out here is that um, in these animals where the salivary glands have been infected with enteric viruses, if there wasn't a marker for the enteric virus, you'd be hard to miss that those glands were infected. Um, there is almost no damage to the salivary glands, no cell death that's um, uh, detectable, even though these viruses, as I showed you, are replicating copious amounts of these enteric viruses. A similar phenotype um, is also observed with SARS-CoV-2, which also heavily infects salivary glands, and there is um, uh, uh, there is not a lot of damage in the salivary. So one 
focus of my group right now is to look at the salivary gland immune response. This is sort of a new frontier mucosal organ and how that compares to other mucosal tissues, the intestine, the lung, and what's the virus composition in the saliva. As there is very little tissue damage and cell lysis, um, it indicates that the saliva may have more uh, uh, vesicle cloaked viruses and thereby be more infectious. In, in contrast, in the gut, for instance, a uh, lot of cells are sloughed off and, and cells lice, and, and that also releases free viruses into the feces. But the saliva could be more enriched in the vesicle cloaked viruses, the more infectious, more virulent form of the viruses, because there's so little tissue damage in cell lysis. And of course, what else is being transmitted by the saliva? How does it impact the immune responses in the mammary gland in the, case, in the case of the suckling or in the intestine when the saliva is swallowed and, and that saliva reaches the intestine? Does it modulate the immune response? Are there things there that could modulate the immune response in the intestine? So these are all kind of open questions right now uh, that we're very excited to, to follow up on. So I just want to end there and, uh, and really thank the people in the lab who did uh, all the work that I showed you. The extracellular vesicle work was started by Ying Han Chen and uh, taken to in vivo uh, with uh, the, uh, another town's postdoc, mine to Santiana and Suresh Ghosh. The uh, uh, work that I showed you about the critical mass of viruses needed for replication um, was spearheaded by a talented postdoc, Banu Bayut, uh, and the more recent work uh, on the enteric viral transmission through the salivary route uh, was spearheaded by Suresh Ghosh. And we have uh, wonderful uh, collaborators at NIH that we uh, work with, uh, Kim Green, um, Matthew Hoffman, Jay Chirini, Yasmin Belgade, um, Gregoire Altambonet, and his uh, postdoc, Dong Yeja. So thank you so much and, and uh, hope uh, uh, to hear some questions and happy to um, discuss more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nihal. This was a great, great seminar. I have uh, already two questions or more in the in the chat here. Um, Sayed is asking um, about the vesicle cloak, cloaked um, um, transmission, um, whether that means that viruses using this route of infection are less dependent on receptor binding. And, um, and are vesicles containing variants selectively taken up by certain cell types? Yes, so um, to answer your question, Syed, this is a very interesting, um, uh, um, so right now, you know, we're thinking more that the, 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 the input critical levels of virus are gonna be more determinant of whether a virus infects a cell than the presence of the receptor or not. For, for a very long time, we've had this view of this, you know, the virus and the receptor and the tissue has to express that receptor in order for the virus to be able to infect. But we're finding now that these receptors are often everywhere. Um, and even in this case of SARS-CoV-2, we know that ACE2 and, and the, and the um, TMPRSS2 are not the only receptors for this virus, that it can use other things to get into the cell. But I think what's gonna be critical is that level, that threshold, uh, and this could be tissue dependent. And I think that's gonna have a, um, a role in, in, in the tropism. And the, and the second question was- uh, Whether what, there are specific cell types that are selectively taking up the vesicles versus being infected. Uh, no, so again, so I'll, I'll, cells take up these vesicles through endocytic pathways, and it seems to be pretty prevalent that they're going in, 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 in most cell types that we've looked at. Now, whether they replicate in that cell or not is another story. And again, that might be dependent on this, this input mass, but, uh, but uh, um, and, and that may depend on the cell type, the host innate immune system in that cell type, how it's wired, uh, uh, translation factors, replication factors, whatnot, but getting in, it's, it's, it's pretty widespread. Question from Francisco. Um, do you have any preliminary data showing cloaked enteric viruses coming from the salivary gland? And also whether you have tried mixing saliva with virus and see if that in increases infectivity. 
So the first question, yes, um, we have preliminary data. We can find these vesicles in the, in the saliva. We have not um, quantified it, and I think that's really going to be important. Um, the second question, we are gearing up to do those experiments. Actually, I have a summer student, undergraduate student who's coming, who's going to be doing those, mixing the saliva with the viruses and seeing if that enhances or, or, or inhibits potentially the, the infectivity. So we're going to hopefully do those. So there's two questions about the, the threshold and the number of variants required for infection. One from Jeffrey, uh, knowing what we do regarding the importance of viral quasi-species quasi diversity for successful infections, have you sequenced the viral populations when looking at the minimal number of variants required for infection? Not yet, but this is definitely on our to-do list. Um, you bring up a very important point, Jeff. In fact, uh, there are a lot of defective interfering particles that are produced. And, uh, and uh, so it's, it's going to be, it may be that in that 14, you only have one that can replicate and the others are all junk. Or you can have minor mutations in a bunch and you have some kind of complementarity. Um, so this is something that we need to sequence and look at what we have there. Okay, and a related question from Suhail. Do you think that the threshold might be dynamically regulated by the intrinsic immune state? Yes, yes, and I have some preliminary data uh, for that, um, but I can't say much more than that because I, uh, we don't know yet, but, but our hunch is that yes. Another question from Sayed, uh, for enteric viruses using vesicle cloak particles, do lipases or bile acid disrupt the vesicles before reaching the gut? No. So we did experiments where we um, uh, 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 fluorescently labeled the vesicles, fed them to the animals, and then at different time points opened up the animals and looked for these vesicles by, with microscopy. And we could find them happily um, passing through the stomach acids and reaching the, the, the intestine. Once they are internalized in the cells through endocytic pathways, that's when um, they, they, they are uh, uh, ruptured um, in the endosome. But the lipases in the, in, the, in, the, in the gut are not showing much effectiveness against these vesicles. And I don't know why. So Nihal, do you think, um, I have two questions, do you think that, that our experimental systems like transfecting viruses into 293 cells and then generating viral particles, is that, you know, reproducing these vesicle cloaked particles? It, or it it could, yeah, particles? absolutely, it could be, because if you're especially trans, um, uh, transfecting in large quantities, and also, you know, when you do these transfections, you really don't know, you know, you have to look at your cells and you often see a, a distribution. Not every cell is, is, uh, is transfected. So there's even stochasticity within the transfection. You know, some cells get a little bit more of the RNA, others get a little bit less. The ones that get more, if they get more than that critical mass would be, would be making it, yeah. Do you think that there's also another benefit of, of these vesicles, you know, having the viruses close together, being more protected or? Sure. So that's a different talk, the, a different yeah. talk. I didn't, uh, but absolutely, there are actually a couple of things with these vesicles. One is um, the, the cloak. I mean, it's a membrane and it does protect against antibodies, secretory antibodies. Um, the membrane composition, the lipid composition is highly enriched in phosphatidylserine lipids, which are anti-inflammatory. And then within the vesicle itself, there seems to be some uh, components, some anti-inflammatory components that are co-packaged um, uh, with these viruses. And that's something that we're looking at across. So we're collecting vesicles from uh, patients uh, for a number of these viruses, and then doing proteomics on those in vivo uh, isolated vesicles um, to see are there uh, common anti-inflammatory factors that are packaged along with these uh, viruses. And so maybe a last question here. 
Oh no, there's another one from Judy. Really enjoyed your talk. Thank you. Are the number of vesicles that are released on block uh, correlated to the uh, the uh, R naught of respiratory viral infections, e.g., measles viruses, which are highly infectious, with its others that are not so infectious? So we haven't really looked looked at that. We have not looked at that. We haven't actually. Measles is one of the viruses we don't study in the lab. Um, but uh, we haven't looked at that. But I think it's a very interesting question you raise, especially with SARS-CoV-2, because uh, some of you may not know this, but SARS-CoV-2 aggregates. And, uh, and it's a very sticky virus and it aggregates. And so that aggregation actually may be very beneficial for the virus to overcome um, this critical, it, it may act like a vesicle in the sense. And, uh, and uh, and, and that may, this aggregation um, of the virus may allow it to increase its dose, the infectious dose. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and this may um, uh, uh, be a reason potentially for why you see spread in certain cases, you know, in hospitals and where you have close contact, people in close contact, um, uh, because of just being able to reach that, past that critical dose. Um, Maybe connected to this, what, what do you think about, you know, measurement of SARS-CoV-2 in the saliva, infection of the salivary gland, infection yeah. this part? I mean, it is, you know, so, I mean, in, in some places, for instance, Israel, that's where they get the, the they, that's where they get their most, uh, the, the PCR from, they take it from the saliva, um, uh, because uh, of, it may be because that's easy, but it also it could be that's a, a fresh source and a high source of inoculum there. Um, so, so, so the salivary gland is infected, but do you think that the saliva is also infectious or do you have- Oh, it is, it is. Saliva is also infectious for SARS-CoV-2. So I have a colleagues here, Kevin Bird and Blake Warner at uh, NIH who first published that report in Nature Medicine on SARS-CoV-2 and salivary glands. And yeah, absolutely, they, they find infectious virus in the saliva, yeah. Okay, I think this is it. Uh, wonderful, you got a lot of questions here. Thank you so much. Thank you so uh, much and appreciate the time. Thank, thank you. Thank you everybody for attending and asking great questions. Um, Nihal, I, I suggest you take a little bit of a break and we sure. meet um, maybe in 10 minutes or something. Sure. Have a Sounds little, good. Little time. Sounds good. Okay. All right. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.